Здравствуйте, добрый день. Говорить буду по-английски, по но я вас всех люблю по-русски, на русском языке. Good afternoon. Uh, so my presentation may be a bit different in genre from others, uh, because I'm academic. And um, since we are in this part of the world, you know, Belarus, next to us is Russia, next to us is Ukraine and, and Poland, I will talk about two artists, uh, which will help us to understand whether contemporary AI art is interesting or not, and the two artists will be Kazimir Malevich and Mark Chagall, right, our Vitebsk uh, son. Before I get into the presentation, I want to thank people for inviting me to Minsk. I travel all the time, but even all my travel haven't, prevented, haven't prepared me for this amazing mindfuck called Minsk, this amazing Sim City. You, the young generation, the creators, the chefs, the hairdressers, the app designers are changing the world. The world was much more boring, gray, predictable place even five years ago and six years ago even more. Uh, I don't know if there are any places left in this planet which are not hip yet, but among the hip places, I think Minsk occupies the A level. Um, I'm here until the June 8th, so I'm looking forward to having a few more days to discover the city. And I love you guys. Thank you for making our world a less predictable place. And I think that's our goal, right? Today we live in the age of statistics, big data, we're trying to predict people's behavior. That's wonderful. But what we really want to do is travel, fall in love, have accidents, and live in a world which is unpredictable. So that's a paradox of our time. Uh, so my talk is a continuation of line of thoughts uh, from my most recent book, which is published in English in Moscow by Strelka Press, called AI Aesthetics. Uh, you can buy it, you can buy EPUB on Amazon for uh, less than, less than, uh, less than uh, three dollars. Okay. And this is a kind of preface. Uh, like many, many years ago, like 20 years ago, I wrote an article which was called Avant-Garde Software, where I said that the real avant-garde, the real cultural avant-garde of our time is not what, do, is not what artists do, but things like, you know, Google Earth and Google Map and the Internet itself and today's Facebook and many applications which you're creating because the best software changes what it means to be human, the best software changes what it means to live in a society, the best software changes what it means to be in a city. And this is a wonderful statement from the first era of digital art in the 1960s. As, of course, you all know, people started to use computers to create art already in the late 50s. And um, this early computer art was active in a few places. One of them was former Yugoslavia. And I love the statement. Pure technology is always more interesting and more beautiful than the art cre uh, created with technology. But not all technology, all the best, only the best one. So today, right, we're aware that many people have adopted various kinds of neural networks, right, including uh, generative adversarial networks to create something we call art. Uh, they were, you know, images which look like mid 20th century paintings are relevant. It's a big question, but this is one of the examples, right? So a network has been fed lots of uh, classical images of modern painters from 20th century, and then it learns some patterns, and then we will help, right, of a second network. It generates these images. Of course, we don't know how well are all the images it generates, because in the paper, we only show us the best ones. And we look, right, like nice images, like something, you know, which could have been done by 20th century artists. So one way maybe to define a art is to say it's art, which is generated by computers with a certain degree of autonomy. And if we show this art to art historians, you know, curators or critics, they'll say, oh, probably it was done by human being. So we can take a Turing test, right, and kind of adapt it to art and to say, you know, the art Turing test, the AI art Turing test would be a test where uh, the human professionals, right, who specialize in the field of art history and art will not be able to judge whether a particular artwork is done by computers and human. So that sounds amazing, that sounds very interesting. Is it? Is it interesting? Is it trivial? In order to better understand it, let's uh, go back to exactly 100 years ago. Let's go back to 1919, 
the high moment of modernist art, the development of avant-garde, and let's see what happens in Vitebsk, a city which is not so far away, between two, right, kind of apt developers of modernism, so to speak, right, between Malevich and Chagall. Um, so I saw this exhibition last year, which kind of focused on what happened between Chagall and, and Malevich in Vitebsk, and this inspired me to give a talk. So what you see on the left is a typical painting of Malevich. By the way, most of, almost all the paintings in the slides were created exactly 100 years ago by this artist in 1919. Um, so Malevich represents, right, one trend in modern avant-garde, in modernism. Uh, it's expressionistic, uh, it's more, let's say, spiritual, it's more subjective, right, it's more poetic. Um, at least that's how we normally think about Chagall. And then, right, this is a painting by Malevich, uh, who represents, let's say, supposedly more systematic, right, more algorithmic, you know, more system-like thinking. Right? So Malevich was not necessarily a great artist, but he was a great thinker, and he was one of modern artists who created the whole system, and his system was called suprematism. And uh, it's a kind of set of rules, right, and set of ideas of how to create new art, new, new objective art, the art where the ground doesn't matter, where the human scale doesn't matter, the art which really represents a kind of cosmos. Right? So, so far, you know, what we see kind of fits the stereotype of our history, right? Malevich is more poetic, more subjective. Chagall is more objective. You know, he paints with hard-edged figures. Uh, but is it really true? So what happens is that Chagall was invited, you know, by the Soviet government to create the first new art school in Vitebsk in 1919. He went to Vitebsk. He started to work with students. And then uh, he made this fatal mistake of inviting like a kind of wrong co-developer, right, a co-partner. You should be laughing at this point, right? Uh, uh, Malevich was older than him. And Malevich, with his more systematic thinking, right, his more dialogical approach, kind of seduced the students. And after a few months, Chagall kind of left uh, in shame. And uh, everybody started to follow Malevich. And then in 1919, one year after you know, the October Revolution, or the October takeover by Lenin and his group of terrorists, you know, they decorated the city in this suprematist fashion. And it shows you that suprematism, like many other modern movements, you know, cubism, surrealism, fivism, was a kind of system, right? It's a kind of algorithm, metaphorically speaking, because you can apply the system to 2D, 3D, different kind of medium, different kind of surfaces, different number of dimensions. So here is, you know, young student of a school, young student of Malevich, applying suprematism to three-dimensional surface, making this kind of beautiful uh, china pieces. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is uh, a kind of questionnaire which the students applying to the school had to fill out. And uh, if, you, if, I, if, I, if you allow me to translate 10D, it doesn't say that the school is going to teach you craft. It doesn't say that the school is going to teach you some skills. It says the school is going to give you knowledge of systems. So here we have new idea about art, right? Art is not craft. Art is not skill. Art is not representation of human being. Art is the knowledge of systems, right? This kind of systematic thinking of modern art. And it's really a system because this work was created by 15-year-old, right? So a student who was 15-year-old who entered the school, even he creates these beautiful Sabinvatsis patterns. And you can see how this pattern potentially can be extended infinitely. You can kind of fill the whole world with a system. Okay. Now, let's look at that story and see if it's actually correct. So what I found at this exhibition is that, in fact, in reality, Malevich was maybe more lyrical, more um, harder to predict, perhaps more subjective, and Malevich was actually quite influenced, introduced by this kind of systematic thinking, right? So this is also painting by Malevich, uh, sorry, by Chagall, I'm sorry, by Chagall, and the only thing which will tell you Chagall is this little kind of peasant, a little, little building, right, in the Mistechko in the center, and the rest is this cubic system, which was really dominating art at the time. And then if you look, and then this is now a work from Malevich, uh, a year later, right, so he takes his typical kind of lyrical figure, and superposes the systematic kind of virus with geometry. And this is also something very unpredictable, but it turns out Chagall is also making this very typical modernist collage. So in fact, he's influenced by kind of viruses of all the different systems which were common in art at that time. 
And then this is, of course, right, one of the most famous paintings of the 20th century. It's also 1919. It's by Malevich, like a white square, right? Malevich is famous for black square, a painting which represented just a black square, but he also made a famous painting which is white square. And when you think about it, there is nothing really systematic about it that if you read Malevich's manifesto, right, if you read his system, yes, it tells you that we're going to represent the space which doesn't have up and down, which doesn't have human scale, which doesn't have human coordinates, the space which is really like a space of cosmos, right, the outer space, but there's nothing in his system to tell you what the size of square to make, what angle to put the square on. It's a completely intuitive decision. And to me, with textures, right, of these kind of two white surfaces, create something which is very lyrical, very uncomputable, in fact, very non-algorithmic. So I want to suggest a kind of different interpretation, but in fact, behind the systematic thinking of Malevich, what we find is that lack of system and really kind of intuition in something which perhaps will be hard to program and hard to predict. Now, let's uh, jump to today, and let's talk about what happened with AI. Uh, so as we know, AI was invented, right? The idea of AI appears in the 1950s. So originally, it was the idea to simulate human, certain human cognitive functions, you know, playing chess, translating, and recognizing things in images. So today, we have many different kinds of AI, right? As we know, what we call today AI can be lots of different things. It's not clear we share something in common. One thing which happened with AI is what I call superhuman AI. Think about search engine, right? Google, Yandex, and so on. You put something in the, you know, in the, search, core, in the search box, and the engine in, in uh, hundreds of milliseconds find the relevant pages among billions of pages. This is not any human can do. So the kind of AI we have today, it's superhuman, right? In fact, it does the things which no human can do. So that's one of many differences between what we have today and what people imagine in the 1950s. Right? In fact, historians of AI talk about so-called AI effect, but whenever AI scientists solve some problem, it's no longer seen as part of the AI field. And that's why AI is always perceived as something which is difficult, as something which is failing, and something which is not fully successful, because whenever some problem is solved, it's no longer seen as part of AI. Right? So, for example, once the translation will become 100% or 99% correct, automatic translation, people will not talk about this way. We say, well, it's not anything special. What's really special is the things which are hard. So that's one of the things. But what interests me is a different development that in the last uh, 10 years or so, AI has also started to be implemented and used by culture industry. And today, AI, right, in the form of data science, you know, uh, predictive analytics, supervised and supervised machine learning, right? I mean, all these different technologies which you know about is now implemented in uh, all kinds of cultural systems. So, for example, things like automatic correction of photographs, which you take with your camera, or which you upload to sharing site, or recommendation systems, right? And the thing about recommendation system, which recommends you books to read, people to follow, movies to see, uh, you know, places to visit in the city, right? it basically models you as a static person, right? It really models you as a static subject and it's trying to predict what you'll find interesting, right? So that's a very interesting development. So 100 years ago, we can talk about systems in a metaphorical way, right? Suprematism is a kind of system, right? Which uh, maybe can be used to predict what kind of paintings Malevich will do or Chagall will do. But today, it's real technology which is implemented on a mass scale. And of course, you know all these examples, but those of you who don't know, right? So you know that today your cameras, your, um, I mean, Google Photos, I mean, Apple Photos, and so on, right, can identify with a certain degree, certain degree, right, of precision, the content of your photographs. Uh, but maybe what you haven't seen yet, that starts about 2014, and this technology is slowly making its way into different services. It's also an attempt to uh, aesthetically judge a photograph and basically predict uh, how much you're going to like it. Of course, it's deeply problematic because it assumes that the aesthetic kind of quality of a photograph is completely contained inside pixels in its photographs, but it's not influenced by what you have seen before, right, by the context. But nevertheless, you know, this kind of Kantian, so to speak, universal subject is the subject you know, uh, imagined by AI, right? So here we have one image which was given a static score of 60 of uh, 85 percent, 
And to me, it's completely trivial, right? But you can see how it fulfills right, certain qualities of good photographs, right? It has a good range of contrast. It's very colorful. It's also something which you can use for lots of ads because it doesn't have any particular meaning. And then there's a very cute image, much more interesting, complex image in the right, right? Of a cute cat with some animal, only received a status score of 40 because, of course, it doesn't follow the generic average rules of good photography, right? The contrast is not full, there is not full range of contrast, right? The image is blown out, uh, it's, you know, there is not a good range of color. So that's a good thing to know, right? It means those in the audience who work in the systems, you still have lots of work to do because you can see how the systems are still very much imperfect. And you also see how what we can now predict is not only the content in the photographs, but also photographic parameters such as selective focus, focus and foreground, and also some kind of subjective, right? Emotional affective terms such as cute and relaxation, right? So of course, another example, uh, right? Most of you have recent phones, your phone can recognize uh, a type of scene, which is your photographing, and then automatically change parameters, right, uh, to make your photo better. So I have Huawei Mate 20 Pro, which Mr. Trump is trying to prevent us from having. Uh, so maybe I'll have to immigrate to Belarusia so I can enjoy my Chinese phones, right? Uh, but, uh, but now all, all, the, all the recent phones are doing it, and then finally examples, right, which is also now shows how it's changing professional photography, right? So this is one of uh, professional AI photo softwares where you click a certain bu single button and goes for photograph and changes 10 different things. It straightens perspectives, it changes the sky, darkens the sky, it does lots of different things. Uh, so here, of course, the software was fed, right, millions of photographs, rated as good photographs by professional photographers, or maybe these photographs got lots of likes on Instagram. And with developments, right, a bit, you know, a bit dangerous potentially, because if all photographs will be automatically changed by AI systems into good photographs, and the photographs which are more interesting, like this one, will be judged inferior, you know, we may, we may, you know, we may one day end up in a kind of aesthetic totalitarian society, right? of aesthetic totalitarianism, right? Uh, it's not so simple, but there are definitely poten potentiality like this. Okay. So now uh, let's go and jump into the 60s. So I was just talking how the use of algorithmic systems, the use of so-called AI, machine learning, is now being implemented on a large scale across culture industry. But until recently, it was very, very small development where just very, very few artists who started in the 50s in 60s and 70s to use computers to create algorithmic art. And this is examples of famous artworks with people in the 60s. Of course, computers were very slow. You couldn't render color image. Uh, in fact, you can only connect, connect computer to a plotter. So a plotter would plot the image and then we would photograph it or sometimes to make animation we would photograph single frames from a you know, cathode ray tube. But there is something right, very nice about these images, some nice interplay between structure and randomness partly because these artists were told by professors who themselves were, were taught at Bauhaus and Futimas, so there's a continuation of aesthetic tradition. And then this is the image of an artist who is commonly recognized as the first artist to use AI. His name is Herod Coyne. He was a British painter. He uh, was invited uh, to become professor at the University of California, San Diego in 1969. Even in 1971, he was invited to Stanford. Uh, which was working on Lisp and some of the earlier work on um, kind of working with text, and we wrote a software for him. And then what's interesting is Harold Coyne was using a single program for the for rest of his life. From 1971 until 2015, when he passed away, he was like working with a single program and just changing parameters. So first the program would generate abstract images, and then slowly he taught it some knowledge about foreground, background, objects, ground. Even eventually in the 90s, he taught it how to do color. Um, and it's very, very inspiring to me to have an example of an artist who is kind of working on one thing for 50 years. Because, of course, the tendency to the technological art is to constantly change the topic. Today is AI, tomorrow it will be, I don't know, plastics, the day after yesterday, day after yesterday it will be interactivity. So people abandon topics every three years, and it's very hard to reach some depth. So there's something very interesting about Harold Coyne. And his goal, right, 
was in fact a kind of reactionary, right? His goal was more reactionary than, let's say, the goal of Malevich or Chagall six years earlier, because their goal was to create new art, the art which nobody has seen, the art which is not human-based, the art which is doesn't can be measured by human scale, the art which is not anthropomorphic. Whereas Coyne, right, making some nice kind of semi-abstract paintings in London, basically wanted computer, uh, wanted to teach computer to make paintings in his style. He basically wanted to transfer his artistic style, his artistic system into a computer, so when the computer can continue doing it while he passed, after he will pass away. Unfortunately, he, uh, Harold passed away. He took his program to his grave, so now it's inaccessible. And the reason I'm showing you also his example, so he started 1969 at the University of California, San Diego, and then he hired another faculty, and this faculty hired me. So when I basically came to UC San Diego in 96, I met Harold, and you know, the best 20 years of my life have been at this university in the program which he first established, so I have a you know, very dear emotional connection to its history. So now, uh, basically one point of my talk, which is really want you to kind of take home, take home point. So if you believe with conventional histories, interpretations, it seems like artists are creating art. Sometimes maybe it's more systematic, sometimes it's maybe more uh, intuitive, right? Especially in the 19th, 20th century, we have these ideas, dramatic genius, the artist expresses herself or himself, he looks, he or she looks inside themselves, and artist is this genius, ta 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 ta, blah 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 blah. And in contrast to this development, these people, right, who are doing computer art, you know, we're seen as people who are like outside of art, we're doing something strange with computers, we're not serious artists. And only in the last few years, right, this art started to be recognized. So as the organizers of a conference who wrote a description of my talk, I'm very grateful to them, and I was lazy, I didn't, I didn't give it to them, uh, but let me actually say something connected with description. Uh, it's no problem, right? Uh, that, as we know, uh, a few months ago, some work generated by yet another machine learning network was sold at the auction for $400,000. It's a kind of random event, but it's still interesting, right? That somebody paid that much money for uh, something which was done by neural network. But here's what I want to say. Maybe we got it all wrong. Maybe our whole understanding of human creativity of 20th century art, 19th century art, and beyond is wrong. Maybe the art has always been algorithmic. And in fact, the art which is non-algorithmic, the art which is not systematic, it's kind of impossible for humans to create. Let me give you some examples, right? So of course, one of these examples is a one-point linear perspective, right, which was invented a few times in human history, including ancient Greece, and then it was rediscovered in uh, Renaissance Italy, and um, this is a famous engraving by Durer from early 16th century, where Durer shows you a kind of machine, right, which was used, in fact, to make this type of drawing. So you have a musical instrument, a flute, sitting on the table, and you have a string connected to a nail on the wall, representing, right, the infinite convergence point, right, where lines converge. And when you take the string and you systematically move them across the boundary with flute, and when where uh, the string intersects the picture plane, you make marks. Because today, right, it's, you know, I can teach you to draw a perspective in about eight hours, uh, but you know, it was very, very difficult, it was very strange. It was like learning neural networks, right? So, <laughs> so you know, people had to make whole machines to do that, right? So, of course, following, following the time, most of European art has been done in perspective. Perspective is also built in into our photographs. So here's one very obvious but nevertheless important example of how all Western art in the last 500 years was algorithmic. But another example is another kind of art which was even more popular in human history, art or craft, it doesn't matter, which is ornament. And I think, right, and there are many people here who program in the audience, right, it's very easy to imagine that you can write a program I mean, it can be, you can use different technology, you know, generative algorithms, you know, simply simple algorithms, whatever you want to generate this ornament, because you definitely feel there is a system, and in fact, the system is not broken. So when you think about these examples, you say, this is very strange. Right? So now we're trying to program computers, we're trying to use neural networks to generate the art in the style of human artists, and art, and art critics and curators are debating whether it's art or not, 
But in fact, all art was always a kind of algorithmic. All art was systematic. So maybe what we should really do if we want to create interesting art is to program networks, to program computers, to train them to do something which humans can't do, to do something which is very unsystematic. But let me show you another example to support my thesis, right? This is one of the most fam famous paintings of Jackson Pollock, right? American abstract expressionist from the 1950s. And again, imagine if you take this painting, you close the right part, right? You only have the left part. I think it would be not so difficult, right? <laughs> to, uh, I mean, I don't know what technology you use, what kind of network or maybe traditional algorithm, but basically write software which will generate the right part or will keep continuing generating this painting and make it infinite and fill the whole Minsk, like huge kind of Pollock takeover, because this art is very predictable. And of course, this is very strange because as we know, uh, Pollock was really uh, trying to make something very unpredictable, right? As we know, he didn't use a paintbrush. He basically used a big paint can. The, the canvas was, was basically lying on the floor, and he would just walk around, right, and splash with paint. But there is some kind of mechanicity of human mind. There is some kind of mechanicity of human body. The result is very, very systematic. Okay, this will skip. And um, I want to maybe say something about possible reason why all human art has always had this systematicity and kind of very high degree of predictability. Um, so this is from a few years ago. So basically we took 100 videos of people walking and then, right, probably trained a network. And then the network was able to, to identify who is who just based on only 100 videos. Right? I mean, try to force yourself to walk in some kind of like, you know, not normal way or try to talk in a not normal way, or try to eat in a not normal way, right? It's very difficult. Our body, our mind has this algorithmic character. <laughs> Only actors right, can get trained to speak in different voices, to act in different ways, to move more in different ways. So maybe this kind of predictability, right, this systematicity of human art and culture has to do with the fact that our whole human identity, mentally, physiologically, sensorially, is based on this very systematic behavior. Uh, okay, I still have four minutes. So this is another little excursion in 20th century art. So what I want to suggest is, in fact, right, if you really want to use neural networks or another technology to create interesting art, right, it's not really interesting to create images which look like another painting by Chagall or another painting which could have been done by 17th century Dutch painters, another painting which could be done by a mid 20th century artist, I think it would be more interesting to create something which humans have a very hard time creating, to create something which doesn't have a single system. Create a play, create a piece of architecture, create you know, three dimensional space, you know, create an image, create a sequence which doesn't work inside a single aesthetic system because it's very hard uh, for us to do. And we can take some inspiration, right, from certain 20th century artists who, in order to create something non-systematic, had to create new systems to break with systematicity, right? And here's a couple of examples. Uh, so this is Anselm uh, Kiefer, right, Kiefer, one of the most recognized artists of today. He's a German. He's been active since the 70s. He has this huge, huge studio outside of Paris, very different very kind of different from the kind of space we are, which is very organized, right? A kind of IT, symposium, circus, right? Factory, everything is clean, everything is organized. Here's this complete mess. It's the size of a few factories. In fact, you have to move around it on bicycle. And he creates this kind of strange world of this kind of semi-broken, kind of non-functional buildings, right? Maybe like a kind of like me mega Minsk, so to speak, right? And, um, and he does, and he has very interesting artistic process in order to break away from a built-in systematicity of normal art. So what he does, he realizes that the only way to create something really not systematic or something complex is to follow nature. Now, when you think about shape of a river, right, or a mountain, or even like individual grass or individual trees, we're all different, we're all unique. Nothing which human created, even this kind of building from Stalinist times, with all these little, like, little kind of Baroque things, nothing can match the real complexity, beauty, and unpredictability of nature. So he says, great, I'm going to follow nature. So what he does is that he takes, for example, some piece of metal, and then he subjects it to a variety of chemical, physical, 
industrial processes, maybe he runs over it in a car, he puts it in some asset, and he works on about 10 pieces simultaneously for three to four years, right, to kind of do what nature does, but accelerate it and to create something which has a kind of complexity and which is less predictable than any artist can do manually, right? So this is his process in his studio. So eventually he also paints or attaches some things to his metal sheets. And then this is a final work, we're kind of huge. And we do have, I think, both traces of human hand. And we also have certain unpredictability, complexity, you know, this uh, almost archaeological, geological sense of nature creating something over a very long process, but not millions of years, in his case, three years. And finally, I'm going to finish with uh, another example of uh, kind of art, which was uh, very important and big in the 60s. Um, so this is by Yoko Ono, uh, one of the Fluxus artists. As you know, she ruined her career by meeting John Lennon, uh, but we all make career mistakes. So Yoko Ono was a very important woman artist from the 1960s, and she and our people would create this kind of conceptual pieces, which is a set of instructions. So it's a kind of algorithm, but if you go and execute this algorithm, the result will be something very, very unpredictable, right? So I will read uh, two of her uh, cloud poems, and I'll finish in exactly eight seconds. Cloud piece from 1963. Imagine the clouds dripping. Dig a hole in your garden to put them in. So if you actually, if you go and you take it seriously, right? And you basically imagine clouds dripping, that's already random, all the clouds are dripping in a random way, and when you somehow dig a hole and put these clouds, I think the result will be something very interesting, something pretty unpredictable, and something very complex. So this is the end. So as I said, I think, which, I think if you really want to create interesting art with computers and, and have this art recognized as something really pioneering and something really different, we don't want to make art which looks like something humans have done before. If we don't want to make something which looks like something humans have been creating always, which is art which is, follows a single system, a single algorithm, a single system of rules, we want to do something which is beyond what we can do. Something which is a bit non-human, something which is a bit alien, something which doesn't follow the aesthetic, any aesthetic, but something we recognize as beautiful, something which will make us cry, and something which will extend our understanding of who we are. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh, it was super exciting. And I have... Just super, super hyper meta. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I have just uh, one question. Okay. Uh, I was thinking of uh, the whole time I was sitting there. Um, have you, of course you have heard, I suppose, about the app which was like on a hype a couple of years ago. It, it's called uh, Prisma. Yes. Which, is, uh, which was oh. the artificial intelligence. What do, you, what do you think of it? Uh, how do you think do such technologies help the art or people to understand art better? Or is it just the hype thing and it doesn't really make any sense? Yeah. yeah. Well, so here's, here's what I think and that's the argument I develop in my little book. Mm -hmm. So I think what's interesting, right, about the use of, kind of machine learning to create artifacts which looks like something you know, we normally would do, right? So you take photograph and make it look like a painting, and this painting looks like a, oh, this maybe could have been done by Chagall and Mondrian, is that if you can reverse engineer the neural network, and you'll actually learn something about how this type of art works, right? So in fact, if you have a network which you can open up, which is not black box, potentially it can be a great help to art historians, to film historians, to literary historians, because you say, okay, here we have a network that generates like Pushkin-like poems. So now we actually understand something about Pushkin, but in order to do it, you really have to be able to make more progress in opening up these boxes, right? So it can be very interesting, can be very educational. The way with this new type of art, of course not, right? Because we're creating something which already existed, but maybe it can help us to better understand how this original art was made. Yes, thank you very much. Let's give a big round of applause to Dr. Manovich.